Back to Sunday Live here at Susan Television. Vicky, we have a one-on-one -on -one with Dr. Ari. Indeed we do. Dr. Mokisa Kitui, the immediate former Secretary General of the United Nations Conference on Trade and Development, or UNCTA. Thank you so much for joining us, Dr. Ari. Um, let's get right into it. You've been out of the political scene for several years now. Um, now vying for the presidency. What makes you feel you are the right person for the job? Uh, good evening, and these are two on one. <laughs> <laughs> yes, uh, there are a number of things that uh, drive my candidature. First of all, that um, I have grown with a sense of purposeful politics from the time I was a member of parliament and minister to the time I've been an under secretary general of the United Nations. I have a clear sense of uh, what I think is the change that I crave for my country. And I've reached a point in my life where I say I have to be ready to be the change I desire. So uh, on a whole range of uh, practical policy issues, on a whole range of uh, inclusion and uh, toning down the rising toxic exchanges, I think there's, an, uh, there's a space for an alternative kind of politics, which I want to drive. Dr. Terry, I have to ask you this question. A lot of people are asking this. Did you finish your term at UNCTA or to run for, come and run for president, or did you resign? What, what was the deal? I resigned from, uh, from my position uh, six months early. Any regrets? No, no, not yet. And you come in on a weekend where the president and his deputy are involved in deep acrimony. What you're seeing on the screens and the headlines. What are your thoughts? What do you think? I've just arrived in the country this morning. I haven't had a chance to follow it all along properly. But uh, one of the things I've said and I did at a press conference earlier today is um, urging leaders for the counsel of wisdom, step back a little. It is hurtful for the country to raise political tensions this early in the day. And when the two most important leaders in the country are so consumed yeah. by this level of unsovereign exchange, uh, the sentiment in the marketplace for ideas, for economy, for investors is all wrong. And I, and I, I thought that they could uh, elevate their responsibilities and tone down the competition, the confrontation a bit. You mentioned you want to engage in more purposeful politics. Yes. Some have labeled you a project. How, how would you describe your political philosophy? Um, I don't know if it's a philosophy, but um, I've recently uh, talked to the issue of a project. A project usually should mean that there is a, a grand master who stands with bigger ideas than yourself, with a bigger scheme of governance issues than yourself, uh, that wants to drive what you do. And I was asking, um, to, to label me a project, you have to give me this giant uh, whose vision I will uh, succumb to uh, that drives me. I, the, the reality is this, that uh, I've been around for some time, I have anchored my sense of political leadership, both through my job and through a program I developed as a premier program for my organization, uh, helping governments train cabinets on coalescing national policy around the global macroeconomic dynamics. And this I've done very successfully to the point where I say, I have a chance to implement what I've been helping others to implement in their countries in my own home country. Yes, uh, history has it that past presidential winners in this country have relied on voting blocks, ethnic blocks. You say you are from Western. Musali Mudavari is from Western. Are you splitting that vote right down the middle even before you began? Uh, do you remember that in the year 2002, there were two presidential candidates from Central Kenya? Uh, well, why, don't you exclude, uh, why do you exclude the possibility that could, Kenya could have two presidential candidates from Western Kenya? Uh, similarly, I think it's important to say the following. Uh, I don't see the challenge here right now as splitting Western Kenya vote. Uh, Musali has been on the ground for some time. I am just coming onto the ground now. I am going to Western Kenya soon to intensively consult at the grassroots level within the community. And the outcome of my consultations will be the basis of any discussion about where the community is going. But I think the most important thing for that community right now is that it has been under voting and registering. The political leaders have not mobilized the people as political players sufficiently. I take it upon myself that I can fill that gap. 
not just talk about elite compromise that this leader and this one sat down and agreed that one of them will support the other, but say, can we turn the population into political actors? Can we find a way of giving them purpose? Can we find a way of turning away from their cool reaction to a politics that has not demonstrably rewarded them as highly as they would have expected, mm. turning them into the largest basket of votes in the next election. I think those are the challenges. Whoever can implement those should lay claim to working ahead as a representative of that community in the national competition. And beyond relying on or getting your community's backing, which is extremely important, especially as you move to the national stage, um, you know, where do you see yourself, which political party do you see yourself using uh, to get to State House, which is extremely important? Um, where do I see myself? I see myself in a comfortable zone. Mm -hmm. that the privilege I have that I have not been, I've never been in NASA and I've never been in Jubilee. I've never been Tanga Tanga, I've never been Keleweke. Means that I can roll out a canvas where I invite Kenyans of goodwill. So whether you have been on, on which side, whichever side you have been in national discourse, say, we can help tone down the vitriol, the toxic atmosphere by defining our politics, our raison d'etre, as based on what is right for Kenya. So will what you be policies the third will force? create hope for the hopeless? Will you be the third force? It will not be a third force. Mm -hmm. I don't think I can play fringe politics, but it will be grounded in the realities that we have to find a competitive team together. It will be on a new political party, but that political party will not seek to be a third force. That political party will seek to have as many people as possible to be preferably one of two main blocks. And that potential running mates? Year. I've not asked, had you ask Ruto who is his running mate and he has been campaigning for seven years. <laughs> Why should you ask me when I've been in seven hours? <laughs> <laughs> Let me take up because for other point out there, she's saying, you know, politics of Kenya is defined by hustler dynasty yeah. narrative. That's where you're, either you're here or you're there. Your thoughts about I, that? I, I, I refuse to believe that this country is defined by hustler uh, dynasty narrative. We have reduced Kenyan politics to that. I am part of a growing force of Kenyans who say Kenyan politics will have to be defined by how much empathy we show to the vulnerable, how much hope we give to the hopeless, and how much clear planning we have for building enterprise Kenya. To me, that is a richer narrative than hustler and dynasty. Hmm. Let's talk about corruption, because I know you've been very vocal about this in the last couple of years. Um, it's a huge monster. You're talking about two billion shillings a day, at least from the president, that's being lost to graft. Uh, Six billion dollars a year being lost to graft in this country. Should you become president, how do you intend to tackle it? There are a number of practical ways that I'll tackle it. I'll not talk about corruption. I'll punish it. And I will demonstrate that clearly by action, not by petty corruption, but grand corruption. As uh, an outgoing under Secretary General of the United Nations, I embrace an institution that's against capital punishment. But sometimes I see the level of grand corruption, and I feel it's such a crime against humanity, it could have deserved the ultimate punishment. I feel very strongly at a time when Kenya is losing competitiveness, even in regional markets, at a time when there's so many hopelessly unemployed and underemployed young men and women, when we're struggling to recover from the COVID pandemic, that so much of our public resources are wasted through graft, and we celebrate the corrupt. I will give a personal pledge that regardless of whose family you come from, you have to walk the talk. I have to ask but also this, importantly yeah. about that, I would like to hear everybody in the competition stand up and say they are against corruption and say that if they are found to have been corrupt, they are ready to pay the price. Let that be on the cards for the competition. Even as you say you want to punish it, you know, we have accountability mechanisms that exist. They are robust, but they don't seem to deal with it decisively. Why do you think that is and how would it be different under your regime? We have seen some of the challenges of uh, slowly evolving institutions that are important in certain areas like in fighting corruption. But I think we have to call out institutions that are failing in their mandate. We have support civil society action that spots a light on those who are reversing the gains that we have aspired to make. And we make the population also know that we can socially condemn and stigmatize and uh, 
keep out of the mainframe leadership the credibility of persons who are responsible for the dire consequences that we suffer because of pilfering public resources. Tatari, we can't let you go without asking you about uh, public debt. Yes. Whoever takes over from President Kenyatta will inherit a huge debt burden. It's at what? Public debt that's 8.4 trillion and counting. If you were the next president, if you become that fifth president, what will you do about that? I will tell the Kenyan people a truth that is not very, very, very nice to hear, which is that we will have to tighten our belts. We must learn that until we build a larger cake, we must reduce our appetites for the cake we eat. We must learn to live within our means. It is not justifiable, even conscionable, for any government to borrow money on which it pays interest for purposes of recurrent expenditure. You don't make any profit on recurrent expenditure. You are just kicking down the can downstream for the next generation. My generation owes the next generation that we do not besettle them with a hopeless debt. And I think the first step to take is re reduce waste. Second step to take is cut down the proportion of public resources that goes into recurrent expenditure to build up the capital base and competitiveness, mm. which will yield the resources for servicing debt. And the other step to take is live within our means. You mentioned your generation owing the next one a lighter debt burden. And, and with that also is the big question on unemployment and the youth. Yes. That just hasn't seemed to leave this country. Right. What will you do differently? I, uh, I've just published as my final instrument leaving the United Nations a Secretary General's report to the next conference of UNCTAD in which I set out what I think are the levers for recovering better out of COVID for the developing world. One of the most important features of this is look at new engines of economic revival. For example, when we are saying that the hospitality industry is going to take a long time in the doldrums, we have to look at what other services industries can create quick jobs. One of the main ones is rapid investment in the digital economy. We are gifted with young digital entrepreneurs who have no access to credit markets, who are asked to show their credit uh, <laughs> records, when the only things they have is their laptop and ideas in their heads. I will find it necessary, just like we've been using public resources to write off the debts of coffee farmers and sugarcane farmers, to use public resources to de-risk credit to the digital entrepreneurs. And, and I, I think I think about this very, very strongly. Secondly, I will at address what makes made in Kenya not competitive. Cut down red tape. When I was minister, I drove cutting down red tape by amending and repealing 35 pieces of legislation, and it worked. We have to look again, what is it that we can do better? Engage county governments on reducing the double taxation of enterprise, the multiplicity of ambiguous rules and regulations that are hurting small enterprise, particularly out of the main towns. These are some of the parts of a national conversation on building enterprise Kenya. Most important of all, we must, as a nation, align reviving and growing enterprise and creating incomes for the lowly, the lowly employed or the unemployed. I think the artificial creation of a war between the rich and the poor is cheap, it is costly, and it is not part of the national interest in the medium or long term. The hope for enterprise Kenya and an equitable growth, including opportunities, investment, and social investment for the vulnerable is part of responsible leadership going forward. That leads us to the obvious question. Next question will be, you know, so where do you stand on BBI? Uh, I don't stand. Uh, are, are you for it? Are you against it? Are you no, no, no. I, I, I think that discourse is it, it's late in the day for that discourse. The discussion about what to do with BBI has been going on while I was on international duty. I could not participate in that discourse. At the time when it was open discussion about what area should be improved on, what area should be taken out, what are policy measures and what are constitutional measures, what important constitutional measures are not on board, at that time I could not contribute because I was an international civil servant. But that train has left the station now? The train is out of the station. The president and the, prime, the former prime minister are very keen on what positives can come out of BBI. Any ideas I had that would have made it a better product are now irrelevant. But as it stands... My sense is yeah. 
there is agreement that there will be a consensus document to go to the referendum. That process will be a solution to some of our challenges, but it will not be a sufficient solution to all of our challenges. So I'm saying, can some of the people not manning that fort try to man the other fort that needs to be man manned right now? Can some of us start growing the attention to how to build post-COVID recovery? How to reconstruct the vulnerable small and medium enterprises? How to recreate linkages to regional markets at a time when global market networks have been destroyed by the rise in economic nationalism in the West? These things cannot wait for a referendum. Let the referendum process go on and let me be part of the group that is doing this complementary work that will meet with the results of the referendum to say, now let us build Kenya for going forward. So if you're saying that the referendum should go on, then you are for the I am saying the referendum will go on while I am attending to other things which are equally important. So as it stands, you do not want to give a position on it, yes or no? I have some opinions about some components of the referendum, but they have been overtaken by events. I'd rather spend that energy on dealing with how can we build enterprise Kenya that will benefit from any improved political ecosystem that may come out of the referendum. <laughs> Going to need a lot of energy, Dr. Ari. Quick last question. Are you up to the task? Um, nobody is born with all its capacities. We all pray to God. We all seek out citizens who share our passion for our country. We all look to believing in ourselves that we want to be the change that we desire. And I believe in myself that I can make sacrifices to be the change that I desire. And I don't think I'm alone in believing like this. All right. Thank you for your time. That's all we have mm -hmm. for now, Dr. Ari, and uh, we'll be watching to see what the rest of the journey looks Absolutely, like. Absolutely, Dr. Ari. All the very best. My Thanks pleasure. Thank you. Would you vote for this man? Let us know.